Hey, uh, my name's Dexter. I'm the founder of a company called Human Layer. We are building the best way to get coding agents to solve hard problems. So tell me a little bit about uh, Human Layer, like what you're doing, like at what point in the stack you're integrating. Um, yeah, so essentially we have a bunch of developer tools and uh, it's a combination of like open source prompts and an open source IDE that lets you manage lots of coding agent sessions. Mostly we focus on Claude Code right now, but lets you manage lots of coding agents in parallel. Um, but part of what we're really like pushing and excited to share with the developer community right now is this approach that we've kind of accidentally discovered of like research plan implement. And it's a way to code of wield coding agents in a way that allows you to get much better results and allows like people doing staff principal level engineering work, large architectures, large refactors, um, to actually be productive with coding agents for more than just, I mean, the, the banner on the 101 is going to say no vibes allowed because we really believe in how do we take these AI coding assistants and make them work for more than just small tasks and make them make it capable, make it possible for a senior engineer to be able to ship a real high quality code with with AI and ship get to the point where they can ship 99% of their code with AI because they're not just limited to like small copy changes, bug fixes, things yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah. What do you find, uh, like, in your space, do you find that p developers are really eager to uh, adopt UI or more reticent? Um, to adopt AI, I think there are, there's a little actually like a rift growing in a lot of companies. Yeah. You have like, among like staff plus principal engineers, there is really like, if you are, if you love coding with AI, you are in the minority. Most people are a little skeptical. And honestly, if you don't invest a lot of time learning how to code with AI, yeah it's probably not going to make you that much faster. If you're a really experienced engineer, you've been at the company for five plus years, you yeah. know the code base, you can go pretty dang fast without using any of these yes. AI tools. Um, so that's most, and then you have the like mid-level junior engineers who get cursor and like, oh, I can actually ship a lot more. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not just like, hey, I'm moving faster, but it's filling in some of the gaps in my expertise. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that code is good. And some of it is a little bit sloppy. Mm -hmm. And so you have this rift growing where these like very seasoned engineers who know their shit are basically they are uh, these very seasoned engineers who know their stuff are able are kind of like every week they're spending more and more time cleaning up the slop that was shipped by ai tools from people who don't quite have that depth of like technical understanding yeah. and so they're actually like hate ai more and more as time goes by and we're trying to reverse that because i think if you want to get a like large productive team at an mm -hmm. enterprise to be able to adopt AI for coding, yes. it has to start at the top. It has to start yeah. with the most senior engineers and they have to set the standards so that they know that everybody down the stack is gonna be able to ship code that they're okay with. Mm -hmm. What does standard setting look like in the age of AI? Because I think, you know, we had very easy targets over the last decade, maybe, yeah. you know, and like, you know, where it's like, we had code formatting things, code right? Format, you, you know, had linters, you had code coverage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I think systematically we've, we've gained tools like, you know, prettier ES Lint or whatever that, that take that out of the discussion. Yeah. Right. Um, which is poses an interesting challenge because now senior leaders have to like guide at a much higher level than just like the code should look like this. Yeah. The point of code review is no longer to catch like, so, uh, my buddy Blake put out this article. He's like a principal engineer at a Chicago company called Sprout Social. I used to okay, work with him. Yeah. He put out this article 12, 10 years ago, maybe, of like the hierarchy of needs for code review. And at the very top, the least important thing is like make sure the style matches. And then it's like, okay, are there any bugs? Like when you're reviewing a pull request, like, okay, style matters the least. Bugs don't matter. Like, does it have a good test coverage? This is all like, this is what reviewers do when they're lazy. Yeah. They're just like, hey, make us more white space here it's or whatever It's very it easy to check the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have things like, okay, is the design good? And then it's like, okay, is this the correct solution? Like, is this the right way to solve mm -hmm. this problem? But I actually think a lot of people, when they, I mean, what do you think? I already gave away all the other ones, but basically I think that the core of what code review is really, really good for is mental alignment. Like more so that. than catching bugs or making sure it's good. It's like making sure everybody on the team is on the same page yes. with respect to like, how is the code base changing and why? Yeah. Because you don't want to ship a thousand lines and then like someone else has to debug it at two in the morning. That's what code review is for. It's like, would you want to review, like debug this pull request at two in the morning? If not, <laughs> we need to work on it before it goes in. Uh, yeah. I, one of my favorite, uh, you know, programmer uh, luminaries is Sandy Metz. Oh yeah. This, like, yeah, yeah, the wrong she, abstraction, right? <laughs> yeah, yep. That, but she has this like two two beers rule, right? Like it's like you want to you want the code 
to be able to be easily read and interpreted at two in the morning where you're like, you know, on the way home from the bar or whatever, yeah, two, and you're getting two, paid. Yeah. Getting paid. Two, I love that. Two I, haven't, I haven't heard the two beers world before. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot. It's super great. She's one of my, she's one of my absolute favorites, but yeah, no, that, um, I think that idea of like, you know, the cost of the wrong abstraction and that type of stuff is so hard. It's more difficult to teach people that piece uh, uh, of the puzzle. Yeah. And so, I mean, so I have a take on the right way to solve this. And it's like, basically, I was working with one of these AI engineers who is really, really good at using AI and was yeah. shipping every couple of days. I would get like a 2000 line PR of like Golang, not and yeah. not like Next.js and Python. Yeah. It was like and not like a Rust, uh, like a sorry. Not like a REST app or a CRUD API or mm -hmm. something like this, but really complex systems code. This thing was managing a bunch of sub agent sub processes and streaming standard. Wow. It kind of looked a little bit like a janky version of Docker. And like <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I, I can't just review this code and be like, yep, the SQL looks good and the endpoint yeah. looks right. It was really re so we figured out as a team, I was like, I want to keep shipping this fast, but we have to find a way where like everyone else can still be productive in the code base. Yeah. And so we spent like eight weeks trying a million things and we settled on this workflow we really like, which mm -hmm. is like you do research, which is like objective understanding of the code base. So just like, how does, I want to build this feature. Tell me every part of the code that's relevant to this. So it's like tracing down, here's the endpoint, here's all the files that matter. It's basically creating a really compact view of the code base for the next coding agent to pick up in a mm -hmm. fresh context window to then go build a really detailed implementation plan. Interesting. And so the implementation plan is in step by step. What are we going to change? How are we going to test it? How are we going to know it works? And it's phased out so you can like basically ship each chunk individually. And those two documents, we spend a lot more time reviewing those than the code. And so that's like, I can't read 2000 lines of Golang every day, but I can read a couple hundred lines of a markdown plan that outlines the changes we're yeah, going to make. Yeah, yeah. And then when I go to review the code, I'm like, cool did we follow the plan like yeah it looks good oh there was a couple surprises but i'm just reviewing kind of the deviations from the plan and making sure that the tests like i read the test and i'm like okay if this black box like property integration test works then i'm confident yeah it, it seems like there's a thread in some of the conversations we've been having where it, it things are moving more from that like strictly technical side to that more human layer where you're having these you know kind of detailed documentations at a at a you know, natural language type of space of like, this is the state of things, this is where we're going, and this is the strategy that we, we want to have. Very research heavy, like you said, and then um, kind of like, you know, bullet play point, you know, plans and whatnot. That's not a skill that, you know, developers, engineers have really spent the last handful of decades uh, embracing. Some of, some of them have it. The people <laughs> who do it tend to complain about it. You look at like your fang companies, they're already building, like the principal engineer or the architect does the design and here's how it works. Staff engineer reviews the implementation yeah. plan, and then it gets handed off. Senior engineer splits it up into tasks. And I mean, this is not how every company sure, works, yeah, but you yeah, can yeah, imagine yeah. a big company that like they're already kind of doing this. It's actually crazy. You think I actually believe that some of the biggest companies in the world are typically like laggards on a lot of new technology okay. are actually way better positioned to make the transition to AI first coding and writing 99% of their code with AI. Interesting. If they can learn it's it's not just planning research and stuff, it's like a balance between that and also like having an expert level familiarity with yes. how models like follow instructions, what information oh, is really valuable to them. So there's also like, you have to have, I mean, a lot of what we do is based on vibes and we just experiment and we yeah. talk to Claude all day for 70 hours a week. And like, that's how you get really, really good. Uh, and I don't know if that's a thing that can be like removed from the equation, but we're trying to figure out like, how do you take that person who is really, really good at AI and proliferate their learnings in a tooling way, whether it's prompts or workflows or document yeah, formats yeah. that enables that to spread throughout the org in a way that doesn't create like a chaotic slop fest. Yeah. So uh, related to that, what are your thoughts on, uh, uh, I think this week in the news was, I think Claude Skills is uh, a, a, a thing. Claude Skills are cool. So you had, first we had slash commands, right? Which is just inject a set prompt into my context window as the first user message or as the next user yeah, message. Yeah. Very useful. We use them all the time. We use them mm -hmm. for research plan. All of our research planning implementations are built on slash commands. And we had sub agents before there were custom sub agents. Yeah, there was just yeah, like the yeah. task tool. And so like we used to have this thing where we had to prompt the main agent to prompt the sub agent 
this exact, here's the message to give to the sub agent. Yeah. And part of that was telling the sub agent how to return its information. Cause what you care about, you're playing this telephone game yeah. of like, yeah. cool, you tell that thing to do this. And then it's thinking and reading and learning about the code base. And it's going to return you mm. a specifically formatted report. And so there's all, you're playing this weird telephone game that yes. makes it really hard to use. So then we got some custom sub agents where you have like built in system prompt. Uh, that you get to control. So I no longer have to tell the parent agent, hey, prompt it in this exact way because it's getting my instructions automatically without the parent agent having to know about it. And then, uh, but then you also can, so you can tell it, hey, here's the output format to give back. So that's really valuable. But the problem there is you always have to fork a context window. Yes. Versus skills, it's like, hey, here's a system prompt to go read and discover, but it can be in the parent agent. Or you can say launch a sub agent to use that skill. So the skills are much more flexible in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, now you, uh, you know, host, maintain, uh, build a group called AI Tinkerers. Oh yeah, uh, t pitch that for me. Uh, so AI Tinkerers is a meetup that started. It actually started in Seattle in like 2023, like pre Chat GPT, basically. Love it. And uh, it might have even been 2022, but it started as this guy Joe put together a meetup group for people who were hacking on GPT three. I don't know if you know if you remember some of the early GPT three demos. Yeah. It was the first time we got like AI to write CSS basically. And <laughs> okay, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, it made a watermelon in CSS or something. It's like, you really had to prompt it and you had to do this chain of thought stuff. There was no instruct tuning. You couldn't tell it to do a thing. You had to like write the whole conversation and be like, what's the next word in this conversation? And you, so your prompt ended with like, ah, yes, I'm an expert developer. And the CSS is open backticks. And then you say, hey model, complete the backticks. <laughs> right, right, right. Crazy. So it started as this group for hackers and builders to get together and swap these prompts. And it's grown to this thing that's in like a hundred cities. Awesome. I run the chapter for, I run the chapter for SF. Um, and the basic rule is like, if you're a builder, if you're a hacker, if you're a tinkerer, you get in. If you're a VC or a product manager or a AI, we call them AI tourists, people who are just really excited about AI but are not actually actively building anything, then there's a lot of other great meetups for you. But yeah. AI Tinkers is all about builders learning from builders. Don't show us slides. Don't tell us about your startup. Come like yeah. put code on screen and show us a weird thing that you learned or yeah. a cool thing that you built. I love that. I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see one of my favorite things about uh, technology advancements is finding the groups of people who just love getting their like fingers dirty with it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. So how can people find out more about uh, AI Tinkerers? Uh, AI Tinkerers.org. If you're an SF, come to sf.ai Tinkerers.org. We've got three meetups in the next two weeks. We've got a hackathon. We've got a dinner. We've got a community meetup, which is like little five minute lightning talks. If people just showed up what they're hacking on.